You know what they say, Mega Man game is good game. This franchise is one of the greatest in all of gaming, with lots of different individual series, each with their own stories, characters, gameplay, and styles. But if the MTV generation is anything to go by, then the only Mega Man games that even exist are Mega Man 2, 9, and X1. Since these people make up such a large chunk of the Mega Man fanbase, it can be argued that any Mega Man game aside from these three is underrated. But, what if there was a Mega Man game so criminally underrated that the people whose favorite Mega Man game is underrated themselves underrate this game? Mega Man ZX, or ZX if you're an American, is a game so underrated that its respective Mega Men aren't even amongst the Mega Men in Mega Man's Final Smash. Proto Man and Base are featured when they don't even have Mega Man in their names, let alone a hint of blue. Hell, if you're watching this video, you're likely a ZX fan already, scouring the internet for any ZX related content. Regardless of who you are, sit down, cause I'll be going over the good and bad of this game to find out if it deserves to be so obscure, and more importantly, to find out if ZX is a failed metroidvania or a hidden gem. I was debating whether to talk about the gameplay or story first, but considering the length of this video, I think I can afford to get story out of the way first. Though this section of the video is going to be packed with spoilers, I'm not just going to recap the game's story to you like a lot of YouTubers do. No, 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 no. This is going to be an actual critique of the story and its themes. So, if you don't want spoilers, skip to the time shown on screen right now. This game takes place about 200 years after 04, and the 2500s here presents us with one of the coolest, if not the coolest worlds of any Mega Man game. Up until 04, we never got to see what your average human thought of the Reploids and the conflicts they've involved humanity in. Naturally, there was a lot of animosity between humans and Reploids, and using this animosity, Mega Man 04 told a compelling and mature story about racism that wasn't mere virtue signaling on the part of Capcom. By the end of the game, we saw that there is a possibility of peace between humans and reploids, but these humans and reploids which we see standing side by side shared the same struggle. Up until the point where their objectives converged, these humans were just as hateful of reploids as the rest of humanity was. And why shouldn't they have been? Would they have been wrong to assume that there is nothing to stop Reploids from starting yet another war that wipes out 60% of the human species, especially if the Reploids were to fall victim to another computer virus. Likewise, with humanity still being bitter, why shouldn't Reploids be scared that humanity will once more try to genocide them as punishment, not for crimes attributed to them, but to their kind? Elpis, a Reploid, even wanted to exterminate the human species altogether as holy revenge for the oppression against Reploids. So, at some point in the 200 years between 04 and the first ZX game, Earth decided that if humans and Reploids were essentially the same, they would understand each other and their hostility would be eliminated. So, humans are now turned into cyborgs shortly after birth, and Reploids are given organs and can age. The previously metaphorical term, Reploid DNA, is now very literal. There's even a strong implication that Reploids can now reproduce, even with humans. So, with humans and Reploids now being essentially the same, there is peace now. The only tangible difference if you can even call it tangible, is that Reploids have a red crystal on their forehead. 200 years ago in the timeline, a human could be like, hey, these robots are pests, we ought to kill them all, and they could rally a crowd of human supporters. But now it's like, what are the Reploids gonna do, give you a laceration with the crystal on their forehead? Come on. 
Reploids aren't going to go around with their stupid wars anymore and humanity doesn't have a reason to kill all the Reploids anymore. Everybody loves each other now. What I really dig is that a lot of this lore is told subtly. There's no exposition dump to say any of this. In fact, this doesn't even play a part in the main story. Details about the nature of humanity and Reploids are told more directly in the sequel, but it's more integral to the core narrative there. In this game, a surprising amount of this is communicated through subtext. For instance, when you see a Reploid mother in a town, or, for lack of a better word, an interracial <laughs> an interracial couple, or when you put together info from the data disks, it all communicates stuff about the society and the world in the 2500s. Overall, this is all very cool, but obviously there needs to be something to disrupt the peace, otherwise we wouldn't have a game. So this is where our villain Serpent comes in. He's an okay villain. I mean, they do a great job at building him up and making him imposing. One way they do this, which I really like, is that in the final level, which is where you fight him, the music is a remix of the track that plays whenever there's a sad moment or when you get a game over. That is a genius way of conveying that Serpent is responsible for everything wrong in the protagonist's life. Well, most things wrong if he plays the boy. He has a more sophisticated plan than most Mega Man villains. Project Haven, as he calls it, is to accelerate human evolution. I'll assume he's including Reploids under humans since he is one himself. Anyways, how does he aim to do this? By making a new aristocracy composed of Mega Men to lead the flock into true greatness. In the ZX games, a Mega Man is someone who is able to synchronize with a biometal a sentient artifact that gives the user the armor and weapons of the combat-ready Reploids of old. This is basically like Power Rangers or human-sized mecha or something else. So then, how does someone become a Mega Man? The specifics are revealed in the sequel, but this game does reveal though not if you play as the boy, that every Mega Man is a survivor, usually the sole survivor, of a Maverick attack. Serpent has been conducting several Maverick attacks for a very long time to realize Project Haven, one of which the protagonist got caught up in. So yeah, he's a brutal Darwinist. One problem is that a lot of survivors would be permanently scarred, traumatized, or downright fucked in the head. In fact, the sequel shows us Mega Man that are downright fucked in the head. Those descriptions, especially the last one, would usually be an obstacle in successful governance. However, he does want to be the supreme ruler in the end, so I guess he believes that he would be an effective check and balance for his cabinet. Whatever. Overall, he's not a bad villain, but I think the sequel's villain does a lot more interesting things with Darwinism. The secondary villains, Pandora and Prometheus, are very mysterious in this first game. They allude to some grander scheme to which everybody in this game, including you, Serpent, and themselves, are just puppets. Narratively though, they don't do much. They're just sequel bait. Next. Let's finally talk about our protagonists. ZX has two campaigns, one where you play as Vent, the boy, and another way you play as Ale, the girl. The basic story is the same, but the quality of the writing greatly differs between the two campaigns. Most Mega Man fans are dudes, so if you haven't played this game yet, but you're thinking about it, you'll probably be thinking, Yo, I'm a man, I wanna play a man's game, I'm not playing as no chick. I think you'd be making a mistake in this case, because the script for Vent's campaign is really boring. He doesn't say anything interesting or fun or humorous, and nobody says anything interesting or fun or humorous to him. His personality is adolescent anime boy and nothing else. And there are adolescent anime boys who are cool characters, Vent just isn't one of them. The script in Ale's story is the total opposite. Everybody says completely different things and there's a lot of character here. She herself is fiery and ponders on interesting questions, and likewise, the other characters have discernible personalities and offer interesting input. There's more emotion, there's more groundedness, there's more fun. There's just more stuff to love in Ale's campaign, such as actual character development. 
The most intriguing part about Vent's story is also its biggest missed opportunity. Jiro fucking hates Vent. Not Zero, Jiro. Okay, okay, so Ale and Vent are both Mega Men, yeah? Because they survived a Maverick attack when they were four. As a result of the attack, they became orphans, so Jiro, who is also a Mega Man, took them in. I really like Jiro. His last line in the ending made me sad and happy at the same time, even in Vent's story. But the thing about him in Vent's story, he is a dumpster fire of a parent to Vent. And okay, sure, he's no more than 11 years older than them. It's very unlikely that he'll do an excellent job, but he is such a knob to Vent and not to Ale. He can be insensitive to Ale sometimes, but at least it's not intentional. There is one scene that perfectly contrasts Jiro's relationship with Vent to his relationship with Ale. In the scene where the player first finds out that Jiro is a Mega Man, different things are said depending on whom you play as. If you play as Ale, Jiro tells his bio metal, Model Z, that Ale is someone very special to him. Then he apologizes to her, one, for not telling her that he's been a Mega Man and a member of the Guardians for a very long time, two, for putting her in danger by knowingly involving her in the delivery of a bio metal, and three, for putting her in even more danger since the botched delivery revealed her to be a Mega Man. He even tells her that he was going to tell her about his being a Mega Man and the nature of the delivery even if everything went smoothly and she ended up in zero danger. Which was the outcome Jiro was expecting. He feels guilty, he confesses his sins, and he's forgiven. I really love this scene. So what happens when you play as Vent? None of that happens. Instead, Jiro lies to Vent. He doesn't say anything about Vent being special to him or whatever. Instead, he just tells him, Oh yeah? I'd only just become a Mega Man, and I had no idea we were delivering a biometal. And yes, it was a biometal, Model X. So where is Model Z supposed to have come from? Obviously, Jiro already had Model Z for a long time, but he tells Vent that it suddenly appeared to him after he got separated from Vent. Please. There's even a suspicious amount of ellipses in his explanations. You know this guy's bullshitting. Then, he bosses Vent to go to Guardian HQ in the most passive-aggressive way ever. All whilst neglecting to mention his relationship with the Guardians. Whilst never apologizing for putting Vent in danger. <laughs> wow. What makes this worse is that Jiro must have told the rest of the Guardians not to talk about him in front of Vent. So, in a striking difference from Ale's campaign, nobody from the Guardians talks about Jiro's history with the organization. The feeling is probably mutual as Vent never refers to Jiro by his name and he feels practically no remorse or sorrow over Jiro's death. So you would expect Vent's character arc to be about not letting Jiro define him and not taking shit from anybody and striving to find the truth, but he doesn't have any arc nor is Jiro's bitter relationship with the Vent even a plot point. In fact, his script is quite schizophrenic since his last conversation with Jiro in the end is portrayed as inspiring when, up until this point, Jiro and Vent have had what seems to be a toxic relationship. His story is just sloppy. So, what is Ale's character arc? Ale has an existential crisis, but by the end she decides to forget about the past and whatever destiny set her up for, realizing that she has had agency the whole time, and so decides that her purpose is up for her to decide. There's a lot of factors that make her question her worth and purpose, and I commend the writers for making her crisis believable. However, her arc is not very compelling because the idea just doesn't get enough screen time. I'm not asking for Capcom to make the whole story some depressing existentialist roller coaster like Evangelion. I just want the protagonist's arc to be fleshed out. Though I will say that the ZX games are ripe for an Evangelion ripoff. But anyways, at least Ale has an identifiable arc, unlike Vent. The existential crisis stuff would have actually complemented Vent's character more than Ale's since he's deliberately cut off from the truth. Since he's told so little about the world, 
Obviously, it would make it even harder for him to figure out what he is doing in the world. Another missed opportunity in Ben's campaign. What else can I say about the story? There are a few little lore details you get when playing as Vent that you don't see when you play as Ale, and this game has a lot of replay value, so I say play as both characters to get as much juice out of this story as possible. Oh, and since the biometals are sentient, they talk, but they don't talk enough. Come on, these guys are supposed to be based on legendary heroes, centuries gone. I really wish that the biometals got more screen time, cause, you know, X is cool, Zero is cool, Hapuya, Leviathan, Fefnir and Phantom are also cool. They're basically in this game, in the form of biometals, but they're pretty much here. Let us see them more often. All in all, Vent's script is so weak it feels like an afterthought, but if you play as Ale, the villain does the job, and aside from some ideas not being fleshed out enough, her story is really cool. Is it better than the Zero games? No. But it's still leagues above any of the X games, that's for sure. So we're how many minutes into the video? and we're only now talking about gameplay. Hope it's worth the wait. The controls in other Mega Man games are frequently described as being perfect, but in this game, they really are more perfect. Your raw inputs have immediate response. Your character's movement corresponds one-to-one -one with your intentions. Every other game, even if it's to the slightest degree, requires you to get used to the controls. ZX isn't like that, it just manages to stimulate that primordial understanding you have about how things should work and feel and react and function. These are hands down the best controls of any platformer, and this alone makes that fundamental core gameplay the best in the whole series. Of course, good controls need a good environment to exercise them in. Thankfully, the level design in this game is almost always fantastic, with lots of imaginative platforming. This hover sequence? Mmm. This mad dash to outrun the lava? Mmm. This stuff with the changing water level? Mmm. This... this is genius. And these aren't just highlights of these stages, these levels are fun the whole way through. Admittedly, a few levels, less than a handful, aren't as charming. Fist Leo stage as well as the final level are both very repetitive. There is also a highway stage that is a simple throwback to the intro stage from X1 and just like in that game it's a very tame level. I can forgive it for being one of the earlier stages and the boss at the end is cool but come on it could have been more action packed. The only downright dull stage is the one in Area C. First, you have to talk to this one dude at the start of the area to trigger it. Don't forget to do this. Then you just search through these grey doors to find these dudes hiding spots. There's no enemies, not ones you're supposed to fight, and there's no boss. This is so lame. Luckily, the rest of the levels are all fun, and usually fantastic. I will say that for a Mega Man game, ZX takes a very long time to get started. Most Mega Man games have one intro stage, but Zero Four was like, no, nah, we're gonna have two. But now in ZX, before you can get to the eight main bosses, you've gotta do four intro levels. Considering the script, I'm not sure there's anything else they could have done, but these missions are definitely the weakest in the game. The game's introduction is still fun, and I don't think it overstays its welcome. It's just that once these are through, you will notice a massive jump in the game's quality. Moving on, one of the two defining features of this game is Mega Merging. Instead of switching between different weapons, you switch between different transformations, each with their own unique properties. Model X is the transformation you get at the start of the game, and the gameplay is based on X's. You even get the double shot from X2 and 3. It's pretty cool. However, once you unlock Model ZX, you can't use Model X anymore. No more double shot. The only way to use Model X after getting Model ZX is if you've beaten the game as both Vent and Ale. The game does have good replay value, so I didn't mind having to do this. Model ZX is what you'll surely be using for most of the game, since you get a strong firearm and a strong sword, and you don't have to worry about ammo consumption. You get the rolling slash by default, and this thing just slaughters everything. 
I would say that it is overpowered, because as long as you are in the air, you can slash infinitely. This is made even more broken if you've got after hit invincibility, since you can safely use this attack whilst tracking a boss's movement. Sadly, this move can really take the challenge out of a lot of bosses. At least the slow motion that kicks in when you use it is exceptionally satisfying. Now, the other transformations aren't bad, but aside from really situational situations, it's difficult to recommend them over Model ZX. Model HX has great mobility that is really fun to exploit, but the combat is pretty weak. Despite its only weapon being a sword, Model HX has really weak swordplay. There's no rolling slash, and the saber combo is really slow. It's just completely outclassed in the sword department by Model ZX. And this transformation has a touchscreen feature, where the touchscreen will show you what the enemy's weak spot is. This is pretty important for bosses, as I'll discuss soon. All in all, if this transformation had faster swings and more techniques, then it could easily be a viable primary transformation for the player. Model FX is probably the least situational, as I found myself using it very often. You get cannons that you can point upwards, though sadly not diagonally or straight down. Still, you can just unload pellets to wipe out goons with. Very fun to use. The level 1 charge shot is irritating though. It's cool on paper. It jabs enemies and flings them away, but it also shoots a fireball if you have spare ammo. If you don't have spare ammo, you don't get the fireball, but you still get the jab. So what's the problem? Well, what if I have spare ammo, but I don't want to use the fireball? Too bad, I'm forced to waste my ammunition. The level 2 charge shot is also pathetic. It creates a timid wave of fire on the floor, but when is this preferable to just shooting the enemy? This attack is made all the more useless since only one of the ice bosses ever comes close enough to the ground for this attack to even make a hit. Once you're out of ammo, Model FX is a no-no for boss fights because your jab has a delay and requires an awkwardly close range to hit, unless you just want to shoot them with pellets one at a time. Wave. Bosses who have after hit invincibility. I mean, you can do it, but it just takes forever. This Biometal's touchscreen feature is that the touchscreen lets you draw a trajectory for your cannons. Okay? I, I didn't find this useful. Maybe you can find a way to get better leverage with this, but in my time, it's been useless. Next, Model PX. It's very similar to FX in that you spam projectiles, and it probably has the best charge attacks out of the ammo behold in Biometal's. The level 1 charge shot is a powerful shuriken, and the level 2 charge shot is a shield in the vein of the classic games. The touchscreen feature of this biometal is... Eh? It shows you some... I don't know, night vision thing? It's really only useful in this one dark area of Hurricane's level where your vision is obscured. There is one glaring weakness of this transformation though, and that is its pitiful aerial game. Instead of firing several daggers in one direction like on land, it fires a volley of daggers in several directions, with each dagger doing one point of damage. Sure, you might hit multiple targets, but you'll hardly hurt any of them. Though, Model PX is surprisingly good in boss fights because the level 1 charge shot is so strong, but consumes such little ammunition. Cool transformation, but the weak aerial makes it a hard pick over Model FX. Now Model LX, this is this is the worst out of the bunch. You can't do any combos with the Halberd, and the single swipe you do get isn't as strong as it should be. Plus, the spinning attack you get in water looks cool, but doesn't do a lot of damage. The level 1 charge attack hardly even counts as an attack because it's just impossible to hit enemies with. It just spawns this snowboard thing that melts instantly. The level 2 charge attack is pretty cool though. It shows this homing dragon thing and it does a nice amount of damage. I like this one. The main purpose of this biometal is to allow you to swim in underwater sequences. There's only two water levels in the game and the bodies of water you find elsewhere are very few and far between. Needless to say, you're not going to be using this transformation a whole lot. Oh yeah, and this one also has a touchscreen function. It points items on the map to you. Yay? But, there is one mechanic that makes some of these transformations ridiculously strong. Models HX, FX, LX, and PX can enter overdrive mode when you press the A button. 
When in this mode, you do a ridiculous amount of damage. It'll take only two saber combos from Model HX to kill a boss. This thing is busted. Model PX though doesn't really benefit from overdrive mode. The daggers still do poor damage on bosses, but but Model PX doesn't really need overdrive since its charge attack is so good already. But overdrive seems to compensate for how weak these transformations are against bosses. They're not impossible to use against bosses, but it's so much quicker to just kill them with Model ZX. Overdrive, thus, turns more difficult into way too easy. The solution should have just been to rebalance the biometals, but whatever. Oh, you can also turn into a regular human, which you'll need to do to talk to the townspeople because, you know, society hasn't seen a hulking warriors like this in 200 years. It's really funny seeing them react to you when you try to talk to them whilst transformed. Most of them think you're a maverick and call for help, but some of them think you look fully hectic. Talking to all the NPCs in the game is really fun in general. I like these guys, they say a lot of fun stuff. Anyways, back to their human form. It has one other purpose, which is so mundane, to crawl through narrow passages. Another downside to playing as Vent is that his crawling speed is pitifully slow. It feels so painful just seeing a narrow passage. It's like, you know what sort of torture awaits you, and because of that you prematurely feel the torture. Should I talk about Model OX? Let's talk about Model OX. Model OX is stupidly overpowered. Basically, if you beat a secret boss, then after beating the game, you can talk to Fleur and reveal the mysterious rock in your item bag to be a biometal. This biometal is based on Omega from Zero Three, and normally it plays just like Model ZX, except when you go into overdrive. Yep, unlike Model ZX, OX has overdrive with infinite ammo. But that's not all. When in overdrive mode, you get to use a bunch of Omega's techniques, which cover all of the boss's special weaknesses. And you get a screen nuke. Hard mode stops being as hard when you can screen nuke the final boss to death. It's all okay, cause it's just an easter egg. The ranking system from the Zero games is gone and in its place there's victory levels. Basically the more times you hit a boss's weak point during the battle, the lower your victory level for that boss is. What are the consequences? Not hitting the weak point means you haven't damaged the boss's biometal fragment, so the fragment you get from the boss has a larger ammo bar. Ergo, the punishment for hitting the weak spot is a smaller ammo bar. I think this is a good reward for more skill to play, cause with some of the special moves and overdrives you can just completely go to town. But you know, if you want to play sloppily, you can still get the big ammo bars, just feed your biometals e-crystals in your set. This is nowhere near as grindy as 0104 though, so don't worry about that. But you know what would have been a cooler incentive for getting a good rank? New weapons, just like in the Zero games. Instead, the only upgrade for getting the second fragment of any given biometal is just a bigger ammo bar. whoop de doo I mean, come on, these bosses have some cool attacks that I would have liked to use. High Vault's lasers would have been so cool to use with Model HX. This fire dash thing would have been so sweet to use for model FX, etc, 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 but whatever. All in all, the transformations are fine, but they need some rebalancing and greater utility to be viable long-term options when compared to model ZX. But then again, some people will say they're meant to be situational, just like the boss weapons from any other Mega Man game. I understand this point, but the different biometals aren't just different weapons. These are different playstyles, so all of them should be realistic options most of the time. Seeing as I've talked about bosses 21 times so far in this video, let's talk about the bosses proper. These guys are all really fun to fight, except for Leganka, he just sort of stays still. Forget about Leganka though, these bosses have a wide variety of attacks, their techniques are all super creative, the battles are dynamic, you're twirling around the arena, and you're always on your toes. Each boss battle feels like Tango with power armor, and that's exactly what a great Mega Man boss battle should feel like. Just like in the Zero games, the simplified weakness system means that the boss order is very free, as opposed to something like Mega Man X1. Sure, you can fight the bosses in whatever order you want, but Chill Penguin, Spark Mandrill, Armored Armadillo, Launch Octopus, Boomer, Koanga, Stink, Chameleon, Storm Eagle, and Flame Mammoth, 
is objectively the best order and you have practically no reason not to follow this order. Plus, since Model ZX can take on any boss, you don't even have to follow the weakness chain. The one restriction on the boss order though is that the levels you get the second fragment of a biometal from need a card key you get from beating the boss housing the first fragment. Oh, the card keys? <sighs> That reminds me of the elephant in the room, arguably the most defining aspect of this game. And its lowest point, Mega Man ZX is a Metroidvania, and one of the wonkiest ones out there. At least the world is more interconnected than in Samus Returns. Okay, okay, okay. Let's start with how the game shows you the world map. In Symphony of the Night, you get this concise map showing every room you've visited thus far. Now. A two-dimensional map like this wouldn't work in ZX because there are some doors you enter on the Z-axis. So okay, does the game give you a 3D diagram to visualize where you are like in Metroid Prime? Nope. You get this unreadable abomination. Uh, what does any of this mean? I'm here? Okay. What's the path to here? Where is up? Where is north? This hardly meets the criteria for a map. Wait, let me look up the definition of the map. Map definition. Map, noun. A diagrammatic representation of an area of land or sea showing physical features, cities, roads, etc. Well, it has none of that. So basically, they fucked up the map so badly that it literally isn't even a map. But you know, if the diagram was the worst part of this metroidvania, then it would just be an annoyance. I mean, a Mega Man metroidvania sounds freaking awesome. But here's what went wrong. A great metroidvania is meant to do three things. 1. Funnel the player through the world. 2. Reward exploration. And 3. Make backtracking a way to open up the game by using newly acquired powers in previously explored areas. So let's evaluate the game on the first criterion. Mega Man ZX is one of those where the fuck do I go kind of games. I mean sure, sometimes the open world is logical. For example, so you get your mission and says go to area E. Well, if you weren't speedrunning, you would have seen the entrance to Area E in the Area C mission. And it's like, alright, you know where to go. This next example is more forced, and you can point that fact out as a criticism if you want. But in the same Area C mission, you also see a room holding the entrance to Area D. And if you talk to a very close by townsperson, they'll tell you that you can get to Area G via Area D. Therefore, when you get the mission to go to Area G, you'll know how to get there. But a lot of missions are just like, Yo, go to Area K, and you're like, how do I get to Area K? Well, I'll answer that question. What you do is just dick around in the open world for however long until you find Area K. I mean, how did they expect anybody to figure this out? I say that 6, maybe 7 out of the 14 stages are difficult to find in the open world because of this cryptic design. So no, the game doesn't funnel you through the world. It just funnels you through game facts. If you want some tips, check colored doors and caves. Also, areas A, B, and C will take you to all of the non-logical places. So then, does the game reward exploration? Let's find out. There are seven upgrades you can find in the open world. These are three of the sub-tanks and the four life bar upgrades. The life upgrades are just as easy to locate as they were in the X games, not really being off of the main route per se, and only two of them require sharp use of your gear. But obviously there's more than seven forks in the road in this whole game. A lot more than seven forks in the road. So most of the time, you don't actually get functional rewards for looking around. Usually, your reward for going off of the beaten path is a data disk, and the vast majority of them don't actually have interesting data. Even the ones that can tell you actual lore stuff have very short descriptions. This is nowhere near being like the data logs you can read in Metroid Prime. But most offensively is the mission system. So you want to play a level? Here's what you do. Go to a trance server, choose the relevant mission, then find out how to get to the level. Okay, now what if you've accepted the mission? 
then you search through the open world for the level, and then you find a different level. Well, it's not the one in the mission you're currently on, so you can't actually fight the boss because you can only undertake one mission at a time. Since there's nothing for you to do here, you just gotta leave this level you discovered and find the level you're supposed to go to. Of course, you can cancel your current mission, but this reverts time, so you go back to the Tron server where you accepted said mission at, and any items you've acquired since undertaking the mission are removed. What a shit show. Spitting in the player's face for making a discovery is the exact opposite thing exploration in an open world game should do. Like, I'm here. I'm ready to take on this level. There's no good reason why I shouldn't be able to go and fight the boss right now. But I haven't commenced the relevant mission at a Tron server, so I just have to leave. Does the game reward exploration? Kind of? Sort of? Mostly no. <clears throat> So far, the game has screwed up two-thirds of the criteria for a great Metroidvania. Getting this last one right in 99% of cases still won't make a good Metroidvania, but it is possible, yet this game still fails. Backtracking does not serve to open up the game, it only serves to prolong the game. Even when you know where to go, sometimes it takes too damn long to get to where you need to. Also, the order in which you do the levels can make the backtracking worse. When you've beaten four of the main eight bosses, you've got to go to Guardian HQ for an emergency. Now, if the fourth boss you've beaten was purple, you can't just teleport to Guardian HQ because Tron server in his level doesn't have a teleporter. This means that on top of marching through Area A to get to purple stage, you have to march through Area A to get to the quickest teleporter after beating his stage. If you thought that was obnoxious, to get to Protectos' stage, you have to March through Area A, then march through Purple stage up until you beat the mini-boss, then you can enter his level. Oh, but if you thought that was obnoxious, suppose that, of the eight main bosses, you take on Leganka last like I did in my most recent playthrough. To get there you have to... <sighs> march through Area A again, enter this cave, then enter Leganka's level. Now. Once you've beaten the 8 main bosses, you have to go back to Guardian HQ for a cutscene, and then you can proceed to the first endgame level. The thing is, this cave has both the entrances to Leganka's level, and the first endgame level. I want to just leave Leganka's level and take a quick stroll to the next level. But no, I have to leave the cave, march through Area A again, teleport to Guardian HQ, play the cutscene, Teleport back to the Area A Tron server, march through the place for the billionth time, go to the cave, and then I can go to the next level. You know what makes this all so tragic? All they needed to do was one thing. Put teleporters on these Tron servers, just like the rest of the Tron servers in the game. Who thought this was a good idea? What was the purpose? To extend playtime? Dude. This game with all of its flaws still has remarkable replay value. Trimming the fat would have only given it more replay value. And sure, maybe fast travel is a cop-out way to make an open world game flow, but much of the early game is pretty interconnected without the use of teleporters. If I have to say anything nice about the open world, it does make the speedrunning more nuanced. In fact, the ZX games are really fun to speedrun because of the tight controls. Keeping a top speed at all times is such an exhilarating experience that I can just forget about the open world. Now, that's pretty much all there is for the gameplay, but there's still a few things to cover. Mini games! I don't even know why they bothered. This game was marketed as an RPG for some reason, and I guess because the game has side quests, it's an RPG. All of these side quests, all of them, are fetch quests. Do you realize that this exacerbates the backtracking problem? You don't even get good rewards for the side quests. Most of the time it's just food, e-crystals, or a useless chip. Oh gee, I unlocked the wind boots! Now the wind doesn't push me in this one room in the whole game. Hey, you know what else the player can do to not get pushed backwards by the wind? MOVING FORWARDS! 
Wow! The only side quest of any note, for all the wrong reasons, is the unholy abomination of a quest line that earns you a sub tank. Here's what you do you talk to one nurse at Guardian HQ, go to the trance server, accept the mission, then go to Area L, destroy random containers until you find the one that, by chance, drops an item. Then go back to Guardian HQ, give the item to the nurse, go to the trance server, hand in the mission, then repeat this five times. Does anything change on each visit? Oh, for every even numbered quest in this questline, you have to talk to a different nurse at Guardian HQ. Wow, variety really is the spice of life. Now, there's no quick way to do this questline. The quickest way has you teleporting directly to the Area L Tron server and going through the Hell Run, but this is pretty much suicidal on hard mode. So the safe but long road is to march through Area A, then march through Purple's level until you beat the mini boss, enter Area L, blow up crates, find the item, leave Area L, fight the mini boss again because it respawns, march through Area A again, then teleport back to Guardian HQ. Six times. <laughs> is it even worth it? No. No. Not on normal difficulty at least. It's a must on a hard mode because for some reason this is the only sub tank you're allowed to have on hard mode. Why? Why? I recorded myself doing this quest line on hard mode and it took me an hour and 20 minutes. Most of that hour and 20 minutes was pure, unadulterated backtracking. But you know what? You don't have to do the side quests. You can optimize your boss order to minimize backtracking. There's shortcuts in the open world. But at the end of the day, on a fundamental level, Mega Man ZX is still a Mega Man game. And I say that putting up with the bad Metroidvania elements is worth it. Cause when you get to the actual levels, man, the game is a blast. Good controls, good challenge, fun bosses, great level design. It's a shame that the open world has to get in the way. With story and gameplay out of the way, what about the presentation? This game is really pretty. The colors are vibrant, the shading on the sprites is mm, bellissimo. Wow, there is so much attention to detail. These flamethrower enemies, you can see their tanks depleting. How cool is that? I like that when you shoot or swipe at the boiling water in Area K, little droplets come out of the stream. I like all the cool cameos sprinkled around the game. I like that in the amusement park level, one fireball enemy's fireballs turn into popcorn. I like that the sound of your footsteps changes depending on the surface, and that Model PX has no footstep sounds because you're a ninja. Backgrounds in this game are also really detailed and gorgeous. This Area B cave is beautiful. This Aurora in Area F is beautiful. Yo, look at the lights on this building in Area O, it's cool. In Area M, it's just such a creepy place. It's almost like it's an organism. Yo, is that a temple in the room where you fight Lure? Wow, this place on the surface of Area J is amazing. Wow, this place in the aquarium of Area J is amazing. This is easily one of the best looking sprite based games on the DS, hands down. Also, we've got anime cutscenes in this game. Sometimes. Most of the cutscenes are text boxes over the sprites or over some still frames. But when you do see the anime cutscenes, they're great. They're just great. I love the art style as well. It's very similar to the Zero series, but not as conservative. Things are bulkier this time around. Maybe even blocky. I think it suits the tone of the ZX series very well. The world is in a better place than it was during the Zero games. There's more stuff to go around. No one is desperately clinging on to survival anymore, so things aren't so minimalist. I've seen a lot of people argue that this art style makes enemies less menacing than in the Zero games. For one thing, your character looks powerful. And second, the simpler art in the Zero games meant that when they were designing enemies, they could only be one thing, killing machines. Even the smallest, most cutesy bosses in the Zero games still look like weapons. Because of this, as well as because of many other things like the vibrant colors, your character isn't as metaphorically small as in the Zero games. 
making the world seem less ruthless. And yes, all of these things are true, but I don't understand why people point these out as a criticism of the ZX games. The world and circumstances of ZX aren't the same as in the Zero games. It's not meant to be a scary world. It's supposed to have feel-good vibes. It's supposed to be more wholesome. It's supposed to be the dessert for the main course that is the Zero series. And it's a fantastic dessert. It's not to say that ZX is just moe shit. There are stakes here. There are sad moments here. Hell, they made an amusement park level melancholy. It is not solely due to the art style that the ZX games are a beautiful complement to the Zero games, but the art style utterly succeeds in achieving this. Anyways, let's move on to the audio department. The soundtrack is phenomenal. It's some electronica rock hybrid, and that might sound like a strange hybrid, but it's, it's not just something that works better than you might think. It just straight up works. It's beautiful. Have a listen to some of the tracks. I'm pulling the music from the official album, titled ZX Tunes, since the actual music in-game has a pretty low bitrate. Yeah, I've even heard clearer music from other DS games. The soundtrack does survive the compression though, not only because the composition is amazing, but because each instrument still sounds like the instrument it's meant to be. There's also several bonus tracks on the album not featured in the game, namely the track titled Innocence, which is just... It's just beautiful. This one really should have been in the game somewhere. It might just be better than the Japanese opening to Mega Man X4, it's that good. Like the visuals, the music really suits this game. These pieces are very gratifying and more hype than much of the music from the Zero games. Not to say that those games lacked energetic songs, but it was usually quite gritty or solemn, though I don't say this as a criticism at all. It's not as dark as the Zero games, but it is emotional when it needs to be. All in all, I love this soundtrack and can't get enough of it. So let's stop gushing about the music and move on to the sound effects. I don't have any complaints here, really. Your weapons all sound powerful, the in-game voice clips aren't annoying, aside from Model PX's firing sound. The dash sound effect just feels strong, the mid-air dash more so, I could go on and on, but I'll just summarize and say that everything has a satisfying punch. Oh yeah, and the Japanese version had voice acting for dialogue boxes, but international versions got rid of all the voice clips outside of gameplay. That's fine, I guess, but it doesn't mean that characterization in the dialogue is largely limited to the wording. Reading the dialogue is still preferable to bad voice work, so if that was the only alternative, I'm happy they didn't take it. 
overall top-notch presentation for the DS. So, to answer the question, is Mega Man ZX a failed Metroidvania or a hidden gem? It is both. There is so much in this package to love. A lot of the characters are cool, the controls are the best in the genre, the level design is superb, the sprites are gorgeous, and the music is stunning. This is a proper platforming installment in the Mega Man series. So why is this game so unknown? Maybe because it was on a handheld? Maybe because they didn't market it well enough? Its anime did get cancelled. Maybe people were tired of Mega Man platformers at this point. Who knows? But even when people do play this game, they often hate it because of the open world. I will concede, this open world is bad enough that it can ruin your first playthrough. As an open world game, this game does have promise. Sometimes you see glimmers of what could have been. Sadly, the Metroidvania aspect is a confusing mess that really doesn't add anything to the game. It's such a shame that this is such a barrier for so many people, because once you get in the levels, you don't have to worry about navigation or anything. Once you get in the levels, you have yourself an extremely polished Mega Man game. So if you had a hard time with this game because of the map, give it another try. Maybe you'll have a better experience this time. If you feel like you need to use a guide, don't feel bad. It sucks that the game is so cryptic, but at the end of the day, when you break it down, ZX is at heart an honest Mega Man game, and one of the best ones at that. Big shout out to Jay's Reviews for giving me a massive wake up call to make this video with his review of Mega Man 04. I've wanted to make this video for a long time and had all of my gameplay recorded in December, but I'm lazy and have been busy with my studies this year. Also, big thanks to Nick for letting me know this game even exists with his playthrough of it. You're a legend, man. I'll have a link to his channel and Jay's channel in the description below. I want to review the sequel, Mega Man ZX Advent, and that would probably take another week. Anyways, this is Dandy, telling you why Mega Man ZX is Dandy. Peace.